Russia, a country full of adventure, culture and vast distances. A continent, a multi-ethnic country. This huge land unites both Europe and Asia. Moscow, capital of Russia, and the largest city in Europe. Both Tsar rule and Soviet communism gave the city its present appearance. And the historic charm of this fairy tale city remains intact. Dramatic history that took place within a great square, red square, that stretches out in front of the Kremlin. In the 1990s, on the northern section of the square, the Church of the Mother of Kazan was rebuilt with the aid of public donations. Resurrection Gate divides Red Square from Managa Square. Outside the History Museum, there's an equestrian statue of Marshal Zhukov, and along the rear of the Kremlin Wall, a noble cemetery. The Alexander Garden allures with its trees, lawns, fountain and equestrian statue. The Kutafya Tower announces the entrance to the Kremlin. It leads over a bridge. From here, the Kremlin can be entered through the gateway to the Trinity Tower. The word Kremlin means fortress, the most famous of which is here in Moscow. The huge Tsar's cannon at the entrance to Cathedral Square has a history of its own. This 40-ton cannon was built in 1586. Cathedral Square is the center of the Kremlin, whose oldest cathedral is the Uspenskaya Sobor. A successful combination of old Russian architecture and Italian Renaissance. The Fichetti Palace is also the work of Italian architects. Here, Russian history was irreversibly influenced when the members of Russia's royal family were assassinated. The Kremlin is located on a 40-meter high hill above the Moskva River. And beyond its protective walls are numerous buildings, palaces, towers, squares and churches. The city's history began with the construction of the Kremlin. It lay at the very heart of the city and was for centuries Russia's spiritual and political center. It was a time when Ivan ended the rule of the Mongols and married the niece of the last Byzantine emperor. Moscow became the third Rome. The embodiment of power and the former seat of power over the largest country on earth. The symbiosis of both church and state made the existence of Russia possible, with the Kremlin always at its center. Opposite the Kremlin, merchants built their own palace that is now the Gom department store. Arbatskaya is a city district west of the Kremlin. In the 15th century, the craftsmen and servants of the Tsar lived here. The pedestrianized area is the heart of the Arbat district, which at various times a number of important representatives of Russian culture lived. And right up to today, artistic freedom is guaranteed. Graffiti artists demonstrate their skills and young people play modern music. In the late 19th century, merchants replaced the aristocracy and demonstrated their wealth with huge apartments and splendid palaces. But when looking closely at the well-preserved classical Art Nouveau buildings, there are also symbols of communist socialism. But each of these buildings is outdone by a gigantic skyscraper in Stalinist gingerbread style that transformed the city's appearance. The Redeemer Cathedral was destroyed and then rebuilt, financed by the state church and various foreign companies. 
The next city district is Sverskaya. This is the home of Moscow's theatre life. An ostentatious area. In 1935, the metro was inaugurated and had 13 stations. Today, there are more than 100 located along 260 kilometers of rail, used by millions of passengers each and every day. The Moscow Underground is fast, cheap and quite splendid. Its stations are veritable works of art. The country's finest artists and architects were commissioned to create the various designs of Moscow's metro stations. The new Virgin Monastery is the biggest and most beautiful monastery in Moscow. Fifteen buildings form a fairy tale complex, newly renovated and close to the river. And the Mother of God of Smolensk Cathedral is the city's oldest religious building. To travel Moscow on water is a fine experience, and there are numerous jetties from which one can embark on an enjoyable boat trip. In summer, there's much river traffic because tourists as well as Muscovites enjoy traveling along the river. Viewed from the water, it becomes obvious how the city has been the subject of constant change. But there's an even more impressive view of the ever-changing city from the spurring mountains. The panoramic view features a capital city that has been admitted to the exclusive club of the world's leading industrial nations. Tsar Boris Gudinov had the Donskoy Monastery built in order to honor the Mother of God from Don, and Regent Sophia later added an external wall and numerous towers. The Danilov Monastery is the oldest in Moscow. Indeed, it was the first monastery that, at the end of the Soviet era, was handed back to the church on its thousandth anniversary. When in 988 AD, Vladimir I married the sister of the Byzantine Emperor and was converted to the Orthodox faith, Christianity became the state religion. Today, the head of the Orthodox Church resides here. From the 15th century, Kolomenskoye was the summer residence of Moscow's royal families and later the Tsars. Following the revolution, this large park complex became a museum of architecture around the Christi Ascension Church. From all over Russia, famous wooden buildings were brought here and re-erected. And there are also the remains of the bell tower at the Gorga Church. Also the front gate, the impressive main entrance to Tsar Alexei's palace that was used for grand occasions. A fine building within the summer residence is the Church of God's Mother of Kazan, a fine example of Moscow Baroque, with light blue onion-shaped towers and golden stars. Around 70 kilometers north of Moscow is the monastery town of Sergeyev Posad, named after its founder, the holy Sergei Reroneske. The founder of the monastery was a man of high piety and authority. He reclaimed much land and had great influence on spiritual life. So originated a living sanctuary of the Russian Orthodox Christians. The monastery town of Sergeyev Posad features the fascinating Russian architecture of bygone times. But it's more than just a monument. Tsar Boris Gudinov improved the monastery following the dissociation of the Russian National Church from Constantinople. The Moscow Patriarch became a titular abbot.
The small Nikon Chapel was constructed in 1548 above the grave of Abbot Nikon, the first successor of Saint Sergei. Also, Tsars and Boyars are said each year to have walked out of their splendid castles to pilgrimage on foot to the monastery, including, according to legend, Ivan the Terrible. When, during the Trinity Festival, the faithful accompany the priests across the monastery's courtyard to the specially decorated churches, everyone visits the Holy Spring. When the Tsar's empire vanished, the realm of the communist rulers was torn apart. But religious faith remained. A fascinating cruise travels across numerous rivers, canals and lakes within the heart of the former Tsar's realm. Past monasteries and timber-built churches to as far as St. Petersburg. In Moscow, passengers board and the boat casts off. It travels past several cruise ships. And soon, the captain welcomes his guests on board. The flooded bell tower of Kalyasin is visible. The captain and officers are on the pontoon bridge. Locks are crossed, and from Dubna, the boat travels along the upper sections of the Volga. Uglich our first port of call. Daily, boats bring tourists here from each corner of the world to visit this place of colorful Russian history. The Dmitrievskaya church is crowned with blue, onion-shaped domes that are adorned with stars. The red color of the church is a symbol of bloodshed. The incidents that once occurred at this place of death gave rise to a time of confusion. The interior features religious frescoes and a huge icon that shines out in a golden frame. Everywhere there are illustrations of the mysterious death of the heir to the throne on the 15th of May, 1591. The bells were ringing loudly when eight-year-old Zarevich had a fatal so-called accident, allegedly while at play. When Tsar Ivan the Terrible died, his wife and son Dmitri moved to Uglich. Dmitri was an intelligent child and grew up under the care of his mother, while his insane brother Fyodor Ivanovich was duly crowned and represented by Boris Godunov. Everyone knew that Godunov wanted to become Tsar. Thus, news of the death of the Tsar's son came as a surprise. Prior to this event, Uglich enjoyed national importance as a major trading center and manufactured its own coinage. Its people lived a peaceful life. Sovereign Andrea erected a Kremlin that was typical of old Russian cities, a walled fortress with watchtowers, a palace, a cathedral, and various additional buildings. The ship gradually leaves the harbor and journeys into the evening. By way of a concert, the passengers are introduced to Russia's musical soul. singing accompanied by both balalaika and accordion, which all make the vodka taste particularly authentic. Next morning, we travel past the Rabinska Dam and follow the Volga further upriver. Again, passengers go ashore. Yaroslavl, one of the oldest trading cities on the Volga, with numerous monasteries and churches. Grand Duke Yaroslavl had a fortress built here in around 1010 AD and lay the foundation for the city of the same name that is in fact older than Moscow.
The Redina Monastery is protected by sturdy walls and for a long period was both the cultural and spiritual center of the city. A picturesque ensemble, almost monumental, whose towers and adornments can be seen from a distance. However, times here were once treacherous, so the monasteries had to be defended. As wooden buildings could be set on fire, from the 13th century, stone was used instead. At the beginning of the 17th century, the city was the second largest in Russia, and merchants and noblemen had their villas built according to Russian classical design. Trade in agricultural products, fish and linen, introduced a golden age. In a radial shape, seven streets lead to the central square of the old city center, in which the prophet Elias Church is situated. A rich merchant's family commissioned this work of art that, due to its beauty, became the central feature of the city. After a night on board, the next morning takes us to Rostov Velikaya, an old boyar town on Nero Lake. The Rostova Kremlin is the town's main landmark a closed complex, as if from a Russian fairy tale. Ecclesiastical splendor beyond white walls. However, no worldly sovereign lived here, only the metropolitan bishop. In the middle of the 17th century, a religious war broke out. Following many struggles for power, Iona Sisayevich ordered that Kremlin Castle be built. The Cathedral of the Dormition and Bell Wall flank Cathedral Square. At the western wall is the Evangelist Johannes Church. The walls of its interior are covered with paintings that create an atmospheric solemnity out of all the abundant color. A number of the motifs indicate that in the 17th century, Western ideas were not at all welcome. And finally, the Redeemer Church. This is a kind of private chapel that is situated opposite Red Square, where Bishop Iona welcomed his important guests and organized various concerts. Today, all is peaceful, and it's as though Rostov Velikaya grieves for the bygone times of its former greatness. At noon, the boat sets off again and travels along the Volga back to the Rubinska Reservoir, past numerous colorful monasteries. On the bridge, everyone is alert. Nothing is left to chance. Soon, after the town of Rybinsk, we encounter a large lock, the entrance to the huge reservoir. Here, the water is 14 meters deep. A large number of villages had to be flooded in order to create the reservoir. We travel into the evening. At noon the next day, the boat passes by small buildings and a nunnery on the banks of the Sexna that became the Volga Baltic Canal. The ship berths in the village of Gorici. Here we visit typical tiny wooden houses, a captivating sight. A rural idyll far from city life, with small vegetable gardens and colorfully painted facades. A place of calm and tranquility.
Close by is Kirillov, a town that was built around a monastery that was founded by a monk, Kirill Belosescu. High walls and fortified churches frame a large inner courtyard, a bastion of religion, and at the same time, the economic and cultural center of the region. Domitian Church was the monastery complex's first building. It all began here. In Old Rus, the monasteries played an important role for the Christianization of the heathen tribes and brought about a spiritual revival. When Saint Kirill died at the age of 90, the monastery had 53 monks and was a place of pilgrimage. At the beginning of the 17th century, the monastery possessed more than 600 villages and became an important landowner with worldly power. In 1919, the monastery was disappropriated, but today parts of it once again belong to the Russian Orthodox Church. In the afternoon, the boat leaves Gorici and travels on the Kovstja that forms part of the Volga Baltic Canal. We cross the White Lake and the Krocino Church points the way. The next day we reach Kitsi, where an open-air museum of old Russian wooden architecture was founded. The main attraction is a wonderful site. Two huge wooden churches, one for summer, one for winter, and in between, a wooden bell tower. Not a single nail was used in its construction. Its many domes are covered with aspen wood. Eighty carpenters are thought to have worked on the construction of this large cathedral. There were no plans, only skill, expert knowledge and a very good understanding of timber. So a unique monument was built. The width of the interior is overwhelming. The annexes blend in with the main area and create an atmospheric hole. Coloured battens separate the picture wall and a wooden door leads to an inner sanctuary. Around 60 wooden buildings were relocated here and a museum village created as a reflection of a bygone time. Since the 16th century, the island was the center of the Spaskia Pogost, that contained 120 villages. But hardly anything remains of that period. Windmills were also brought to the museum island, and they make a fascinating display. Powered by the wind, the mill house turns with the wheel. Many of these outstanding masterpieces are to be seen on the museum island. They make up the world-famous ensemble of Kichi, the largest wooden churches in Russia. In the evening, the boat crosses Onega Lake, accompanied by a romantic sunset. Now, a short visit to the engine room. Again and again, we pass through even more locks. Next, it's the captain's dinner and our final evening on board. The following morning, we reach our final destination, the once proud new capital of Peter the Great. St. Petersburg, the Venice of the North. Splendid buildings were constructed here, such as the Winter Palace and the Hermitage. From the time of Peter the Great, the Russian rulers acquired much art. Since 1922, the art collections and the Winter Palace have been open to the public.
Through these halls pass the ghosts of great artists who've made a priceless and historic impression. The Hermitage is home to Greek and Roman treasures and also to many of the Dutch masters. An impressive monument of Peter I adorns the square. And the Admiralty is one of the city's most famous landmarks. The impressive aerial architecturally symbolizes the greatness of Russia as a maritime power. 24,000 tree stumps were used for the foundations of Isaac's Cathedral. This splendid St. Petersburg monument can accommodate a congregation of 14,000. The third largest domed building in the world, its cupola is 100 meters high. At the widest part of the Neva is the regal and dominant Peter and Paul fortress. Peter I wanted to protect his capital city from Sweden and also to safeguard the passage to the East Sea. At the center to the fortress is the Peter and Paul Cathedral, the final resting place of the Tsars and until 1858 the city's main religious building. The marble sarcophagus and the bust of Tsar Peter the Great are in the first line of Tsar graves. Luckily, the fortress never came under attack. At around 10 p.m., the crew of the battleship Aurora fired the first shot, the signal to take the Winter Palace by storm and to bring down the Imperial regime. The plan was to build a replica of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. However, the actual result was one of highly independent Russian classicism. The Cathedral of Our Lady of Kazan. The most impressive and awe-inspiring cathedral in St. Petersburg. The aristocracy did not support the creation of a new city in the remote northwest of the country, also threatened by the Swedes. And when in 1703 St. Petersburg was founded in the swampy delta of the Neva, no one could imagine that such splendid buildings would one day be built here. Many aristocrats were forced to settle here, and the people were extremely wary. From each corner of the country, laborers were brought here to battle meter for meter in order to retrieve dry land from the swamp. St. Petersburg became Russia's capital city and remained so until 1918, when Lenin and his revolutionary Bolshevik government moved to Moscow. The atmosphere of the market is a unique mixture of a Western European market and an Oriental bazaar. There's haggling and each and every kopeck is argued for. It's an amazing sight. In earlier times, family and friends met in St. Petersburg as frequently as possible. Feasts fit for a czar and vodka, champagne and wine flowed like water. Both song and dance were the vital elements of any celebration. It's then that one can feel the joie de vivre and temperament of the Russian soul. The blue-white Resurrection Cathedral of the Smolenia Monastery is thought to be the most beautiful work of Baroque architect Rastrelli. The name of the cloister is a reminder that the tar which was poured here for the ships was called Smola. Nearly 27 kilometers from Petersburg is Pavlovsk. Here is the former summer residence of Tsar Paul I, son of Catherine the Great. Of amazing dimensions, the palace was created by five of the leading architects of that time. 
whether parade halls or private rooms, everywhere the splendor of multifarious works of art and superb interior design greets the eye. It's difficult to fathom the luxurious lifestyle of that time. Hardly three kilometers from Pavlovsk is Pushkin, known as the Tsar's village. This is the location of the large Catherine Palace that can't compete in size with the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, but certainly at least equals it with its splendor. More than a hundred kilos of gold were used for the gilding of its interior. The charm and luxury of this complex immediately captivates each visitor. This summer palace was originally designed by Rastrelli in resplendent Baroque style for Tsarina Elizabeth. Tsar Peter the Great was high-flying and desired a palace outside the city. So the Grand Palace of Peterhof was built, the Versailles of the East. The Tsar himself chose its location and sketched designs for both park and palace. Landward, the Baroque estate is entered via the parade gate and upper park, at the center of which is the Neptune Fountain. But more impressive, and therefore more prestigious, was the arrival of guests from the sea. Here is the Great Cascade, one of the most beautiful and perhaps the largest display of fountains in the world. The brilliant dimensions of the lower park underline the fact that this residence was a symbol of Russia's newly gained naval power. The Venice of the North was Russia's new gateway to the West, a conceptual architectural design and an almost homogenous style influenced by the West, an imperial metropolis. The most beautiful section of the Trans-Siberian Railroad travels from Irkutsk in Siberia to the massive Lake Baikal home of the Buryatis. The origin of the most beautiful city in Siberia was a wooden Cossack fortress built in 1661. Today, around 700,000 people live here. Irkutsk boasts some fine wooden architecture with several richly decorated timber-built houses that date back to the 19th century. The wooden balconies are not wainscoted, but instead are decorated with various ornaments, with magic symbols to fend off evil spirits. The city became home of the Dekrebisten, those who fought for liberty in the former Tsarist Empire and were eventually banished to Siberia. The Maria's Erscheinen Catholic Monastery was founded in 1683 and survived the communist regime. Today, it's the seat of the Archbishop of Eastern Siberia. Here are the graves of the famous such as that of Gregory Skelikov, the Russian Columbus, who crossed the Pacific on the orders of Katharina. This is also the final resting place of Princess Katharina Trubetskaya, and also that of her two sons. The princess was one of the few women who followed their husband into exile in Siberia. The Erlöser Kirche is one of the oldest stone buildings in Siberia. It was originally constructed of wood in 1704, and six years later, the timber was replaced with stone. A 
On the edge of the city, on the banks of the Angara River, a museum ship lies at anchor. An icebreaker that was transported here from England in various sections. It was assembled in 18 months and for some time was used to transport the passengers and cargo of the Trans-Siberian Express across Lake Baikal. Alongside the Angara, the road cuts through numerous birch forests. On this journey that leads to the source of the river, the museum village of Tautsi was built. An open-air museum that depicts the daily life and work of the Siberia of old. It features a collection of objects that date back to the 17th and 20th centuries. A unique treasure trove of bygone days. A chapel that is adorned with icons is just one of the many timber-built architectural monuments that were brought here from eastern Siberia. The rebuilt timber Ilimska Fortress, with its watchtower and main gate, is only one part of this huge museum that extends across the slopes of the Angara River Valley. There's also a school and various villages that have been occupied since time immemorial by the Evikis, Tofis and Boyatis. Arts and crafts are also made here, clay pots and various objects. The road leads to the main outlet of Lake Baikal and to where a shaman rock marks the source of the Angara River. Next we visit the Baikal Museum. Large notice boards display much information about Lake Baikal, Russia's holy sea. Various creatures are kept in huge water basins, such as the Baikal seal and the omul fish, which form this region's staple diet. Further inhabitants of the lake are exhibited and are also depicted in numerous drawings. Beyond the museum is Listwayanka, a Siberian health resort, the Lake Baikal Riviera. Both smoked and dried fish hangs from every market stall. But also Russian dolls, tiny stone seals, wooden carvings and Siberian headwear. Almost every building offers overnight accommodation. Everywhere people sing and play music and the gentle sound of the balalaika is a nostalgic accompaniment for the hearty character of the Siberian soul. Outside the town's gates is a mooring for the ferry that is slowly approaching from the opposite bank. It's only here at the outlet of the Angara River that the lake can be crossed with ease. On the opposite bank is the terminal station of the Baikal Railroad. In Port Baikal is the modern Circum Baikal train that takes a full day to travel around Lake Baikal. Our journey on this historic railway line now begins. It's one of the most difficult sections of the Trans-Siberian Railroad that travels from Moscow to as far as Vladivostok. Particularly this section is a masterpiece of Russian railroad engineering, built between 1902 and 1904, according to the design of Savrimovich. A technical triumph. This was one of the most expensive railroad projects ever, but a very necessary one. Today, it's the longest museum in the world. The Circum Baikal Line is an extraordinary project that is popular with both Russian and also international visitors.
The combination of maximum technical output and fascinating scenic landscapes make this short journey an unforgettable adventure in the land of the Holy Baikal. The famous Trans-Siberian Railroad, the longest railroad in the world, was built more than a hundred years ago at the command of Tsar Alexander III. Originally, the large Siberian Railroad traveled from Moscow to Port Baikal, and from Vladivostok to Mysovaya on the opposite bank of Lake Baikal. The lake was the last major barrier to be conquered. The mountain range south of Irkutsk could not be avoided due to the huge lake. So following an American model, the idea was to cross Russia's biggest lake by ship and to disrupt the railway line. The train stops in the small Siberian village of Polovinaya. Everything seems like something from a fairy tale. The bay is an ideal place in which to eat, and the courageous swim in the ice-cold water to nearby ice flows. The sturdy steel construction of a bridge and an old steam engine highlight the amazing pioneering masterpiece that the railroad represented. The slow journey continues on what is today a single line. There's still some distance to travel to the terminal station of Slyudyanka. In 1902, construction of this eastern section began. It took only two years to lay this difficult 84-kilometer-long section. For each kilometer, one carriage of explosives was used to blast a route through the rocky terrain. So originated one of the most scenic sections of the Trans-Siberian. Lake Baikal originated around 20 million years ago and is one of the oldest lakes in the world the biggest freshwater reservoir on Earth. Three hundred and thirty-six rivers supply the up to sixteen hundred and thirty-seven meter deep Lake Baikal that has only one outlet, the Angara River. Indeed here, one-fifth of the freshwater supply of our planet is stored. On the 30th of September 1904, the first train traveled along the new line alongside Lake Baikal and the golden buckle of the Trans-Siberian Belt was completed. Next, we continue our journey on the normal section of the Trans-Siberian. And during the night, we travel a long distance across the Russian part republic of Buryatien with its capital of Ulan Duda. The lengthy train arrives at the station in the early morning. During each stop, the brakes and wheels are checked. And in the larger stations, both the engine and driver are replaced. Ulan Uda, an exotic city with a population of a million. For the first time, we get a feeling of being in Asia. However, the largest head of Lenin in the world emphasizes the region's association with Mother Russia. Once a winter fortress was built here on the Uda River by Russian Cossacks who were traveling east. Through a triumphal arch that was built for the visit of Tsar Nikolai II, the road leads to the center of the city and the old town. Ulan Uda is a modern city. On the 10th of July, 1878, a savage fire destroyed more than half of it. The pedestrian area is a wide street that leads through the city center. Flanked by fine renovated buildings with many Western style shops alongside the traditional.
Finally, the street terminates on the banks of the Uda at the Our Lady of the Hodigi Traya Cathedral, one of the most beautiful Baroque churches in eastern Siberia. This vibrant city boasts around a hundred nationalities and tribes. The proximity of this city to Mongolia is obvious. On one of the city's hills are some large yurts, circular tents that are common in Mongolia. They serve as tourist restaurants and places of entertainment. Also, the performed music and song can't disguise their Mongolian roots. The mystique of the Buryats and spacious horizons, a special part of the huge realm of Russia. Russia's sunny south awaits us. Sochi is the main town on the Russian Black Sea coast, a subtropical coastline that at a length of 145 kilometers is known as the longest health resort in the world. For over a hundred years, it's been Russia's most popular health resort, whose sea station is a popular landmark and welcomes everybody who arrives from the sea. Sochi is the northernmost location on our planet with a subtropical climate that originates by way of a rare combination of sea and high mountains. Leading from the harbour is the Russian Riviera Promenade with stony beaches and smooth sea sand, plus striking pavilions. Here people bathe and have fun from dawn till dusk. Fun is the order of each and every day. From late afternoon, the promenade has transformed into a place of entertainment. High above the Riviera Promenade is the Archangel Michael Cathedral. This house of God was dedicated to the city's patron saint and is well decorated with gilded icons. The church was built in 1874 and in 1994 renovated. In communist times, Sochi was also a resort for the rich and powerful. They had huge villas, theatres and an opera house built here. Abundant nature formed the exclusive surroundings of these buildings that were mainly constructed in classic, exaggerated style. A cable car travels on the summit of a hill that is known as Dendrarium, a park complex that was established by Russian businessman Sergei Chudikov. Nowhere else on earth grow so many species of plants from various climatic and geographical regions as do here, all under the open sky. The editor of the Petersburg newspaper had the Villa Nadezhdia built for his wife as a summer residence. It features various fountains and groups of figures, as well as the Mauritanian pavilion. The history of Sochi began with the discovery of sulfur-containing springs in Manchester, and in 1909 the first spa and hotel was inaugurated. The mineral water here is said to be a fountain of youth and is supplied by 30 artesian wells from a depth of 70 to 3,000 meters. On one of the city's hills shines the St. Vladimir Church with all of its towers and columns. A splendid new building in the style of Russian Orthodox architecture.
Riviera Park is situated next to the mouth of the River Sochi, an entertainment park amid the oldest green spot in the city. Until late evening, there is noisy hustle and bustle between the flower beds and palm trees. Those who experience a summer evening on the Black Sea understand the allure of Sochi, a veritable paradise in Russia's south. A wide land, nature, culture, immense contrast and a dramatic history have formed the Russian soul. Indeed, the entire country is a treasure trove of history. And according to an old saying, Russia is large and the Tsar is far away. <laughs>